Well, we're back in school again today. So I hope all of you are thinking in terms of being a student because in preparing this lecture, it kind of reminded me all the way back to when I was in college and wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I, so I had applied to medical school. But at that point in time, I didn't know if I'd get in. So I thought, well, as a backup plan, I'll, I'll become a biology teacher because I really enjoyed biology. And uh, I got into medical school, but here I am today talking biology. So you are and I are going to kind of explore uh, the mystery of the pot belly syndrome. So have any of you noticed it's, that this has become a little bit of a problem in our world today? <clears throat> so, and, and, and if there was an easy solution, you would have thought someone would have figured it out by now. But because it seems to be so common and yet so hard to treat, I mean, I'm, think, I'm, I'm reminded of the story of the, the, you know, the doctor who has a very quick visit with the patient, and just as he's leaving the room, he pokes his head back in and says, and you need to lose about 40 pounds, <laughs> and then leaves. You know, that's, that's no instruction or anything. Well, then the patient pokes his head out and says, so do you. <clears throat> and that's really the way it is going. You know, uh, it doesn't matter who you are or what you know. This condition of pot belly syndrome seems to be affecting, uh, well, it's affecting about 70% of people. And it's not only in the United States. It's a worldwide epidemic. And so there's a big question now, what's going on? And, you know, there's lots of answers as to why it's happening. But hopefully today, as we go through my presentation, it will give you further insights into the phenomenon and what you can do about it. So the first 30 minutes here, I'm going to kind of play teacher and kind of explain to you my model of what I believe is happening. Uh, I could spend, probably we could spend all day talking about this topic and not exhaust it. But uh, then at the end, I want to I wanna spend about 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes, however, however much time we, can, we need, really, to talk about solutions. And hopefully it will be more of, a, of an ex, uh, interactive type uh, pres, uh, presentation at that point. So everyone knows where the thyroid gland is in your throat. And actually, we're gonna, that's going to be the last thing we talk about because it, it does link up to this problem and it links up in several different ways. But before we talk about that, I need to talk, we'll, we'll start with the pot belly itself. This, this, this little guy, this little guy right here is very representative of what's going on. And, and it's also the scale. Some people don't actually have a pot belly, but it's visceral body fat. It's actually fat that is developing around the organs and in the liver. And it's, some people are talking about it as a new endocrine organ because it doesn't just sit there. It's not, it's not inert. It is a storage system, but it does create these little like uh, protein messenger molecules called cytokines. And we're going to talk about how the cytokines trigger inflammation and and how all this starts to fit together. This is such a complex topic, I really did not want to approach it from the left brain perspective. The left brain perspective would be to talk to you about a lot of concepts and a lot of research studies and a lot of statistics. I wanted this presentation today to be a right brain presentation so that when you walk out of here, you will have a pictorial or a kind of a uh, a picture of what's actually happening that's, uh, that's causing this. And this little book by Daniel Pink basically says, in the world we live in, this is how we all need to be thinking because it's getting so complex and there are multiple variables at work in any given situation. And so you need to think systemically and see how things are working as a system, uh, as a structure, so to speak, uh, a dynamic structure that is creating certain results. 
And that's going to be my model today is that the, the potbelly syndrome is the result of several elements working simultaneously, locking people into a structure, so to speak, a functional structure that traps them in uh, the obesity state, uh, which we call the pot belly. So I'm going to teach with what is called a mind map. A mind map is just, is just basically taking the elements of the structure and defining each one of them and doing it in a way so that you can start to see relationships. So this is so that you get the big picture. It's highlighting the elements of the picture, helping you see that these elements work together in a way that results in a kind of outcome, not necessarily the outcome you want, but it, it shows you how there are what's called causal loops that are linked together. And I've just in the last four to five months been working with this idea of causal loops. You know what a feedback loop is? If, you, if, if, we, if we put two microphones close together and you started getting that terrible sound, as long as they're together, that sound will continue to feed back and the screeching will continue. But if you can pull them apart, then, then it stops. There's a lot of different feedback loops in the body itself, the endocrine system, um, really a lot of systems in the world are basically looped systems. And so we're going to show you how the pot belly syndrome is itself a complex <coughs> causal loop system. It's, it's made up of several causal loops. So our job today is to identify these causes and then figure out ways to begin correcting the elements that make up the loop. So let's, let's just spend just a minute here and talk about causal loops because this to me is the kind of the breakthrough understanding that I've gained that has helped me to deal with patients that have complex illnesses because a lot of the people we see at the Reardon Clinic, they don't have a simple, a simple disease. They have a complex syndrome or a complex series of looped uh, links that are, are keeping them ill. So a causal loop is a linked chain of causes that interact in such a manner that supports the persistence of their ongoing existence. So probably this, this should begin to sound like a lot of modern diseases like fibromyalgia, uh, diabetes itself is a kind of causal loop. And it has to do not only with what's going on genetically within the body, but it has to do with our environment, stress, uh, uh, cultural, cultural ways of eating, uh, financial factors. Just about everything can start to loop together to get you stuck in one of these uh, causal loops. Every chronic illness is a locked loop causal chain linking two or more biological dysfunctions into a self-reinforcing pattern. And you know, when I talk to people who have pot belly or who are struggling with their weight, they'll say, doctor, I, I've tried everything. I've tried this diet and that seems to make it, I mean, I can lose weight, but it comes back. I've, someone's, I've been put on thyroid and that may help a little bit, but it doesn't seem to quite do the job. I've taken various supplements or diet pills, and it's, it's like a monster. It won't let go of me. So discovering and correcting the core elements of a patient's causal loop is key to breaking the driving pattern of the illness. So it, we have to identify the elements and figure out what is it can we do, that we can do to correct them and you have to correct several of them. You can't just correct one thing. You can correct one thing and it kind of makes things a little better. If you correct two things, uh, it's better yet. Uh, most of the research on these causal loops says that you have to correct at least three elements before you can start to see really significant improvement. This is our, our project for today, students is to understand this very complex series of causal loops. But we're not going to try to understand it all at once. You know, the human brain, the right, even the right brain, 
has to take and isolate each one of these elements. But there is a kind of strange logic to this and we will go through it element by element and just kind of build it. We'll build it as a chain and, the, and it has its own kind of logic. So we're going to take away everything that's up there except for the, the, the problem, which is we're going to identify the core problem as pot belly. Because really that's what's the visible manifestation. It's the tip of the iceberg. The rest of the iceberg is this very complex series of causal loops. But pot belly is the thing that upsets people the most, that they feel so helpless to deal with. You know, you can do so many crunches and you can do all this and you can do all this heavy duty exercising and for some reason it'll help a little bit, but in many people it just doesn't seem to solve the problem. So hopefully today we can begin to understand the various elements that are giving rise to this, this uh, condition that we're just gonna call pot belly. So this is our little guy with his pot belly. And actually, uh, if you want to read more about this, this would be the, the book for the class today. Um, it's called uh, The Potbelly Syndrome, How Common Germs <coughs> Cause Obesity, Diabetes, and Heart Disease uh, by Russell Ferris and uh, Dr. Martin, Marin. It's really a very readable book. And actually, the website that goes along with it, potbellysyndrome.com, is, is very good, it's, it, and I'm actually pulled several of the slides and will include them in the lecture today. So that'll be the, the resource for those slides and I'll, I'll point them out to you. Um, I'm reminded, Dr. Reardon and I, uh, probably about 15 years ago we were at a medical meeting and we were with one of the infectious disease doctors here in town, Dr. Keck Hartman, and we were joking, you know, uh, about what really does cause disease. And Dr. Hartman made the comment, he says, probably as time goes on, we'll begin to find out that just about everything is caused by an infection. And if you think back, you know, we used to think that, that peptic ulcer disease, you know, ulcers was stress, and now we know it's H. pylori infection. And we used to think that heart disease was cholesterol, and now we know that there are bacteria that invade the plaque and cause infection and if you've got like gum disease you're more prone to heart disease so so this thing about germs causing a lot of common illnesses it's turning out to be more and more true and and that's going to be a central part of my thesis today so I've taken all the arrows and the uh, the lines out and we're just going to start with one we have the pot belly here but we're, we're going to start with this idea here of increasing antibiotics. Uh, has any of you ever called your doctor and been refused an antibiotic, just out of curiosity? It's really easy to get antibiotics from your doctor. How, did you read the article in the uh, Wichita paper, I think it was about three or four weeks ago, weeks ago about the whole debate on the use of antibiotics in livestock and chickens and that's big. I didn't realize this, how many millions of pounds of antibiotics are used every year uh, to feed pig. They put it in, the, in, the, in pig feed, chicken feed, the dairy cows get all kinds of uh, injections, the beef in the feedlots, just about every major feedlot employs a veterinarian to, when the cows start to get sick, the, right away he's giving them antibiotics. But the main reason they're giving them antibiotics and the reason it's continuing even though it's controversial is that there's about a 10 to 15 percent increase in body weight and rate of gain of body weight in these uh, farm animals. And so it's really being driven by the, the uh, ranchers and the chicken producers and the, uh, uh, the hog producers themselves because they can get hogs to market, get, or get uh, animals to market, livestock to market to market much faster. <clears throat> and, and the FDA, even though they, they came out with a ruling suggesting that they not use uh, uh, antibiotics in feeds, uh, they didn't really make it a law. It was just more of a suggestion, and it's been pretty much ignored. And so it's, it's, it's coming to a head now because of the fact that uh, we're starting to see more and more resistant strains of various uh, infections. 
Plus the fact that uh, I, I know my mom, uh, she grew up in the era when antibiotics were first discovered. Does anyone here remember when antibiotics first came out? I guess it came out in the early 50s. I was just being born at that time. But it was considered a huge advance in, in uh, the field of medicine. And many people suggest that the, the prestige that medicine has Surround, it surrounds the whole the invention of antibiotics and the fact that finally infectious disease could be conquered. That was the, the theory that right, right after the antibiotics were being developed that, that we would just conquer disease. But in reality, what, what happens is that the bugs are pretty smart and they will develop uh, various resistance strategies uh, as time goes on and, and uh, more and more antibiotics are being developed they're getting more expensive, but uh, the bugs are becoming smarter and developing uh, higher levels of resistance. So, so we have an increased use of antibiotics, both by doctors. Now, there are counter movements. There are many uh, movements in family medicine and pediatrics saying, you know, we've overused antibiotics, but it's still, the, my brother who's a pharmacist says that uh, antibiotics are the number one thing that they fill at pharmacies. Now, the next element in our, in our little uh, loop is the germs. And I've got uh, a down arrow and an up arrow. Uh, the down arrow represents the fact that antibiotics are, to a, certain success, to a certain extent, very successful. If you have a serious infection, by all means, you want to be on an antibiotic. And thank goodness we do have antibiotics, and they do knock out germs. To, in, to, to an extent, and that's why I put this other arrow here, because uh, they also do what? They select for resistant strains. This is why if you've ever been given an antibiotic, you're supposed to finish it, uh, because if you don't finish your 10-day course or 14-day course of antibiotics, what you've done is the antibiotics have picked off all the weak bacteria, and it's selected for the stronger uh, bacteria that's in your system. And there's all kinds of bacteria in your system. You know, even in your gut, you have over 370 species of bacteria. Most of them are supposed to be friendly, but when you do take antibiotics, you're knocking out a lot of your friendly bacteria. And my analogy to patients is, think of it like your lawn. If, you, if you've got a few weeds in your lawn and you kind of get carried away with the Roundup or whatever weed killer you're using and you knock out the good grass, you're creating patches of bare earth where you very soon will have other types of weeds or crabgrass growing in that'll be even harder to get rid of. And that's, the, that's what seems to be happening because we live literally in a sea of germs. Another thing that's happening is and it's a theory that we have become so germ conscious our, that we, we, we are using so many types of uh, antiseptics in our kitchens and antiseptic soaps that uh, kids are not being exposed enough to some germs and so consequently their immune systems are not getting tough enough and this is, we have the phenomenon not only of more resistant strains of bacteria coming up but we have a generation of kids who are eating poorly bad diets, uh, high sugar diets, which seem to weaken the immune system, low nutrient food intake, and uh, then not being exposed to some of the same germs that they were before. And so consequently, the, uh, we have the emergence of uh, these, these very serious strains of resistant bacteria like MRSA. You know, MRSA is getting to be a, a really big problem because uh, uh, if, you, if you can't get it under control with some, some oral antibiotics, very often you have to go in the hospital uh, for IV antibiotics to the tune of $1,000 a day or something like that, depending upon which antibiotic you're on. And, and even then, uh, you have to do this for a prolonged period of time. And even those antibiotics, the vancomycins and some of the, more, some of the stronger antibiotics are not working as well, especially if the host, if the, if the patient is compromised in any way, if they're if they have a really poor diet or they have a chronic illness of some sort, then they're really at risk for developing these, these more potent germs. And you know, hospitals, um, our son, who's a third year medical student, we were talking about MRSA, and he basically said, Dad, the doctors there really believe that 
anyone who works in the hospital has got the MRSA on their system. So you're not, it's just not limited to hospitals anymore. But when you go into a hospital, they really are trying to do a lot of, you know, hand washing and whatnot in order to prevent the spread of these uh, antibiotic resistant germs, which are becoming more and more common. So that then is giving rise to an increased rate of infections, which are then feeding back into a, you know, a greater need for antibiotics and the germs are becoming more resistant. So here we have a causal loop that's occurring very often in our culture and then throw in the, the livestock antibiotic exposure uh, that, we're, that to most people in, inadvertently are exposing themselves to. And we have a situation where people are kind of sickly in many ways and, and they're, they can be uh, not all the way with a fever in bed but just feel tired a lot and maybe night sweats and just low grade chronic infections or uh, serial infections, chronic sinusitis, uh, some people have the, the cough that, that won't go away for several months, uh, you can get uh, various infections of the gut recurrent urinary tract infections, various skin infections. So this, this is a serious problem, but what does it have to do with pot belly? Uh, this, this is just illustrations of one of the germs that has come about because of this loop, and it's, it's called chlamydophilia pneumoniae. And uh, chlamydia was the old name of it. The, the new name is chlamydophilia pneumoniae because it starts out as pneumonia, but what it does, these uh, bacteria are actually invading your white blood cells. They're invading the immune system of, of your body and the white blood cells are spreading them throughout the body. And, and I'm, I'm very suspicious that this is at the root of many of the coughing diseases that people get that they can't seem to get over that last for a month or two months or for quite a long period of time. And this is the example of how it it kind of gets into the immune cells and goes throughout the body and, and is released to various uh, organ systems within the body. And uh, this, this, you can't see this very well, but it just shows us that there are increasing numbers of uh, this showing up in the serology tests, the mycoplasma, the chlamydophilia, uh, some of the other uh, types of germs. The interesting thing about this is that some of the doctors, some of the websites that I've been to say that these germs like mycoplasma, H. pylori, chlamydophilia, at one time were not really thought to be all that bad. Uh, they were more like commonplace germs. And they're now being defined, there's, there's like three types of germs. There's germs that are very innocuous that we're all exposed to, we get them in our hands but they don't really make us sick. Uh, then there's the germs that are very serious that, uh, you, you know, you could die from uh, and you have to go in the hospital for serious, for uh, very heavy duty antibiotics. These are called the middle path germs. They're, they're, they're not strong enough to kill us, but they can infect us and they just kind of hang around. And there are some viruses like that too, the Epstein-Barr virus, uh, the uh, cytomegalovirus, but then the bacteria would be the mycoplasma, the chlamydia, chlamydophilia, uh, the H. pylori, which can get into your intestinal tract, the C. difficile. Uh, there's a bunch of them that can infect the gastrointestinal tract and just set you up for low-grade infections. And then there are others that are postulated, the cell wall deficient bacteria, that it's, they're very hard to diagnose, but one of, the, one of the theories of chronic fatigue syndrome is that you have one of these middle path bacteria, or maybe several of them, Lyme disease is an example of that, where people have a low-grade infection, not enough to get outwardly sick, but enough to just feel sickly a lot of the time. And these chronic infections elicit a response in the body called inflammation. And, and the inflammatory system, if you've ever been to any of my lectures on inflammation, it's the sentinel that guards us. Thank God we have a good inflammation system because the inflammation system is what throws our protective mechanisms into high gear. And it does that, that, does that through these, it's, uh, the technical name for the inflammatory system is the acute phase response. And all you have to do is remember the last time you had the flu, you were sleepy, you were lethargic, you were 
didn't have much of an appetite, you were um, uh, achy, you know, just didn't feel very good. There are certain blood tests like the CRP that goes up, the ferritin goes up, your albumin level goes down, you don't synthesize hormones quite right, your bone formation goes down, you start, uh, people will lose some weight, it's the wrong kind of weight loss, they'll lose muscle mass when they're sick, that's the negative nitrogen balance. Their, their, their nutrient stores are depleted, they're, they get anemic, their white, cell, their white blood cells go up, their platelets go up, and there's a, there's a major release of cytokines which orchestrates the inflammatory response. And so there are like five phases, I'm not gonna go through these, but mobili mobilization when you're starting to get sick, escalation to kind of meet the threat, transformation where you, you're, you're shifting to more of a cell-based inflammatory response. At first, you know, your antibodies are activated, then the cells activate, and then it exaggerates, and hopefully in, with the intent of, of knocking out the infection and, you, and it resolves. But for some people, these phases just go on and on. They never get to the resolution point. And so these are these three paths that I was talking about. The inflammatory response, your immune system eradicates the germ and you get well. The second path is uh, the immune system can kill most of the germs, but not all, and you develop a chronic infection. And the third path is if your immune system cannot kill the germ, you will die unless you get medical attention. So what we're talking about here that seems to be on the rise are these middle path germs. And so these, these trigger the release of all these different cytokines. And if you go into the medical literature, there's a lot being talked about TNF-alpha and, and the IL-1 and the IL-10 and the C-reactive protein. These are all little communication proteins that uh, kind of orchestrate the inflammatory process. But uh, if you have an overabundance of the inflammatory cytokines, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, you're going to stay in an inflammatory state. And a, lot of, and a lot of times this is what looks like the autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are people who have an over-signaling of the immune system and their inflammation is just going and going and going and they, and they have all those, they have all of those symptoms of uh, they, they feel tired, they feel lethargic, they, their appetite's off, they just feel sickly, and that's due to the cytokines. And so I won't go to this slide very much, but it, it basically, uh, as a result of this, of these inflammatory cytokines and the inflammatory system gearing up, gearing up, the body recognizes that too much inflammation is a problem. You know, too much inflammation can hurt you. It's almost like if you have a, a disturbance instead of just sending in a few patrol cars, the National Guard arrives and just starts shooting people. You know, this is a, an overreaction of the inflammatory system in an effort to try to get rid of the problem, but it can itself create problems. So the body tries to counter-regulate that by making more of this stuff called cortisol. Cortisol is a hormone that your adrenal gland makes, and it's anti-inflammatory. This is actually a lot of times if you go to the doctor and you've got a bad infection, not only will he give you an antibiotic, he'll give you a round of prednisone or a shot of prednisone in an effort to kind of cool down your inflammatory response because it's almost like more than what you can handle. And so in a sense, uh, the, and this cortisol is, is triggered by the cytokines. So cortisol in a sense is a good thing but if you have a chronic infection, a middle path germ or two or three that's in your body, it's going to just keep triggering more and more cortisol to try to tone down the inflammation. So you see how this loops back up here. You know, this is a chain going down here, but the cortisol is a kind of a feedback loop to try to keep the inflammation under a little better control. But I don't know how many of you have seen someone who's been on cortisone for a long period of time. It's called Cushing's disease. It's a kind of a cushionoid appearance. And how do they look? Well, they got a belly. That's, that, that's, they've got a belly fat. Let's go a little bit. Okay, let's, before I get into that, let's talk a little bit about this delicate balance. So, so this is my, the way of showing how 
the acute phase response, which is the inflammatory response, is like a gorilla. It's there to protect you, but you get poor appetite, poor fat storage, weight loss, low blood pressure, low cholesterol. There's, your body goes into a kind of a, a catabolic state. You're losing a bunch of your resources. So what cortisol does is it increases your appetite. You, you store fat. You gain the weight back. Your blood pressure goes up. Your cholesterol goes up. But because it's inhibiting the inflammatory system, you're not going to kill the germs as well and you have low body temperature, you don't sleep as well. Anyone that's had prednisone, you know that the day you get that big dose of prednisone, you just have a hard time sleeping and you go into a kind of a numbness state. So cortisone is supposed to be a good thing, but what I, when I put this together, I said, even the little dove got the pot belly here. <laughs> so uh, so that's, that's supposed to be a way of balancing, but if you balance for a long time with too much cortisol, these things be, get, get over-accentuated. So inflammation increases cortisol, cortisol decreases inflammation, supposedly. But one of the other big things that cortisone does is it, it causes insulin resistance. Cortisone causes insulin resistance. This is why one of the reasons why you don't want to be on long-term um, cortisol, prednisone, or something like that, because if you're on too much of it for a long time, you will develop diabetes. It, what it does is that it, uh, the receptors on your cells that normally respond to insulin, they downregulate. That's what we call insulin resistance. These receptors don't respond to the insulin, so your body starts making more insulin. And insulin itself is a fat storage hormone. So now we've got cortisol and insulin working on you as a result of having maybe a chronic germ or two in your body. And your blood sugar starts to go out of whack. You get hungry when you, are, when you have more insulin on board. You're more inflamed when you have insulin on board. And so cortisol, cortisol is, is, is there as a counter-regulator to insulin because insulin will cause your, your blood sugar to fall and cause uh, various things to be stored. It's kind of like a storage hormone, whereas cortisol causes blood sugar levels to rise and your fat can be burned. And so it's, it's part of, uh, of an adaptive response, but if it goes on for too long, and see more of the fat is stored as visceral fat, your LDL cholesterol will go up, the bad cholesterol, your livers and muscles actually get poisoned by too much fat, the so-called fatty liver. People will come back and say, doctor, I've got elevated liver enzymes. What's going on? You've got fatty liver disease or steatohepatitis. And it's just because of too much fat in your liver. And most of the time, it's due to the fact that you're, you've got prediabetes or diabetes. And we're seeing this in babies and kids now, elevated liver enzymes, because they're getting too much sugar. And then the, the, the result is the fat builds up in their organs. So long-term exposure to even subtle cortisol excess sets the stage for this insulin resistance. And so when I give my talks on diabetes and prediabetes, I'm always talking about insulin resistance. So a little bit more about this. Insulin is needed for the cellular uptake of glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids. And by the way, you know, if you have insulin resistance, not only are you having trouble taking up glucose, you're having trouble taking up amino acids, which means that over time, you're going to lose muscle mass. So a lot of people who are gaining weight, at, by the, at the same time, they're losing muscle mass, and it's your muscles that burns calories. Do so you see how this is getting to be a, a loop? The more this happens, the more likely you are to continue gaining weight, continuing to be hungry, continuing to eat more, continuing to have suppression of your, uh, of your immune response, so you have your chronic infection never resolves. And so all of these things are just ganging up on you. Liver, muscle, fat cells use insulin for long-term storage of energy as glycogen and fat. That's, that's why uh, insulin is a good thing. Cortisol slows the movement of insulin into the insulin-dependent cells, resulting in higher blood glucose levels. Uh, yeah. And then why... What is the survival of this? This is an interesting slide. What are the vital insulin independent cells? Well, that's your brain, your, which, uh, which you need if you're in a, a survival situation. You're, you need oxygen delivery, your red blood cells. You need your, uh, your kidney filter, 
your kidneys working and you need immune and wound repair cells. So um, insulin resistance is the body's attempt to preserve functioning in these very important life-sustaining cells. They do not they do not need the insulin, so insulin resistance kind of helps them. These cells depend upon the minute-to-minute -minute availability of glucose for energy production. So you could almost say that the pot belly syndrome is someone who's in a co constant state of stress. The body thinks that it's being threatened at all times, and so uh, it's a kind of sustained fight-or-flight response, and so the glucose levels run higher. So from a new evolutionary perspective, cortisol-induced insulin resistance was meant to serve as a short-term survival tactic in order to maintain the vital functions of the insulin-dependent cells until the danger passed. But in our culture, we have uh, threats that are not really to our, to our, our life, but to, their, to our psychological well-being or to our financial well-being. And so people can live in high-stress states for long periods of time. And so this, this slide gets into a lot of detail that I won't go into, but it's just basically insulin resistance actually sets the stage for the metabolic syndrome. And so that's what I'm going to get into next. That's the next uh, loop here is the metabolic syndrome. The metabolic syndrome is uh, syndrome X, and that's why I have a big X here. And it's due to insulin resistance. It's high blood pressure. It's uh, central obesity, the weight gain in the uh, visceral fat area. It's your cholesterol and lipids going up, and it's your, uh, and your blood sugar going up. So those are the four elements of the uh, metabolic syndrome. And unfortunately, when you go to the doctor nowadays, the doctor really, this, this is not thought about. This is, the, you know, not, this is the part of the iceberg that's under the surface of the water, it's not, you don't really see this, you have to do special tests to detect it. What the doctor sees is that, by golly, you've got high blood pressure, you've gained weight, uh, your, your blood sugar's running a little bit high, and, and you've got some hypertension, high, you know, I mentioned high blood pressure, and then the high cholesterol. So, okay, I can give you a prescription for the, the, the Lipitor to get your cholesterol down, I can give you a prescription for metformin to get your your, uh, to get your blood sugar down. I can give you an antihypertensive to get your, the blood pressure down, the metformin to get your blood sugar down. Oh gosh, I don't have a really good weight loss pill. We'll just have, can't do anything about that. Uh, go, go see your dietitian or go exercise more. And that's, that's basically what people are being told these days. And none of this, the rest of this is being dealt with. That is the treatment, the standard treatment for metabolic syndrome is just to basically treat uh, increased waist circumference, increased triglycerides, HDL and LDL problems, blood pressure problems, and glucose problems, which to my mind is not really treating the underlying causes. It's just treating the symptoms of these underlying causes. And this is very prevalent. We, you know, we know this. Uh, obesity, 15% uh, of our population is frankly obese. 60% uh, is overweight. Uh, hypertensive, 18 percent. Hyperlipidemia, 34 to 50 percent. Prediabetes is getting very common. And so the syndrome X diagnosis is, is fairly common as well. And it's true in the United Kingdom as well. It's, it's happening in all the civilized countries around the world. So this then is giving rise to the pot belly because that's one of the manifestations of syndrome X is the central obesity, the visceral fat. Uh, gain. And so this, this whole side here really is, is, is really kind of the first half of what I wanted to show you of how this leads. Now, how does it link back? How does it link back? Because we want to fill in the rest of this. Here's the, in the, uh, in metabolic syndrome, you have the visceral fat building up. This is a normal CT scan, the normal organs. There's some fat there. But when you get the metabolic syndrome, you have a lot of visceral body fat develop, and your waist size goes up. That's a very easy way to diagnose this syndrome. If you have an increasing waist size uh, the, beyond these numbers, uh, you can pretty much bet you're, you have metabolic syndrome. And then if, you've, if your blood pressure is going up, if you're having trouble with your cholesterol, or if you're on those medicines, uh, that's what's happening. 
That's looking down at the abdomen. Yeah, they, they like made the cut right through the abdomen. And it's a CT scan. CT scan, and so you can, you can see the spine. These are the muscles of the back. This is the wall of the abdomen, and these are all the, the bowel loops, and then between the bowel loops is all, these, all this visceral fat that's developing in the omentum and various organs within the body. So this is all part of, this, kind of, this slide kind of ties it all together, how inflammatory conditions then, uh, if you have any, anything causing chronic inflammation, that feeds into this problem as well. And so it just feeds the insulin resistance and it just makes it all the harder to treat. Sure, anything that's, if you, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, anything that, any disease that you're dealing with where the doctor says you have something itis, it's a chronic inflammatory illness. And very likely this, several of these things are happening. And one itis breeds another, because very often if you've got arthritis, then you've probably got diabetes, and diabetes sets you up for heart disease, and you know, uh, people will have chronic skin conditions, uh, dermatitis. So these are not isolated things. And then, the, then we get into the whole thing about stress. Uh, you know, like I, like I mentioned in this, that if you have short-term stress, this, this response would be fine. But what happens in our culture is we have long-term stress. The danger never passes, and so we re it results in this low-grade, chronic, high cortisol level. And then that tends to reinforce the insulin resistance, which over time becomes type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the chronic hyperinsulinemia also uh, messes up your metabolism as well. So, so I went ahead and put stress in here. Uh, the pot belly, and a lot of people are distressed by their pot belly or by the chronic inflammation or some of the consequences of chronic inflammation. So stress is both an outcome and it also makes the pot belly worse because stress, you can see the line going over here to cortisol and to cytokines. Stress triggers more cortisol output. So your adrenal glands are on, under constant uh, stimulation in, in our culture more often than not. If you, and that's why it's nice if you can get some downtime, some relaxation time. That's why I'm taking a vacation right after this, this <laughs> lecture. <laughs> uh, okay, so modern long-term stressors. Uh, you know, we're a hur hurried up culture. You can just look at these. Or we're not getting enough of these things. The, that lends to stress. Or we're getting too much of this whole row. Um, so these are reasons why it's easy to get into the stress loop. And stress kind of, again, it feeds these, these pathways. It, it, uh, when you have high cortisol level, it makes you really hungry for carbohydrates. If you've ever been on prednisone, you get really hungry for carbs. And so people who are in this pot belly syndrome uh, really want to go for the carbs. And so and so stress is a major factor. And then I'm going to have added toxins right here. Toxins are endocrine disruptors. And I give a whole lecture on toxins. And it's, uh, it's one of those things you, you can't really see toxins. But if you, you know, there's been a number of different measurements done. There was done, one done on a group of 10 babies where they took cord blood and measured for over 250 uh, chemical toxins. And most of the babies had around 180 to 200 on the average that they got from their mother. They, didn't, they weren't even in the environment, but they got it through the mother's exposure. Uh, endocrine disruptors include preservatives, pesticides, plastics, pharmaceuticals are a kind of endocrine disruptor. Uh, heavy metals, uh, you know, you can get the mercury in your, in your fillings can le leach out. Uh, there's metals in food. Uh, there's uh, uh, cadmium in cigarette smoke and, and in uh, automobile exhaust, uh, hormones, genetic uh, modifiers. There's plastics, the bisphenol A. There's PCBs, which are, uh, they're basically used in grain elevators to prevent rodents, but then they feed that grain to the animals, and so the animals build up PCBs. DDT, which is outlawed here in this country, but we import a lot of our 
our produce from countries that have not outlawed DDT, so we are not free from that. The phthalates are in the water bottles, dioxin, the, the heavy metals. This is kind of interesting. This over on the right-hand slide is a lot of the diseases, common diseases, are really due to toxins. Uh, alcoholism is obviously the toxin is alcohol. There's a toxin called adrenochrome that can cause schizophrenia. Parkinson's, they think now, is due to pesticide buildup. Narcotics is a kind of toxin in a pain addiction syndrome. The hepatic steatotosis, the uh, fat buildup in the liver, fructose, diabetes, processed sugars, obesity, non-whole foods, food sensitivities are due to undigested amino acids. PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, too much testosterone because your liver's not breaking it down properly. Celiac disease is gluten sensitivity, and then that's that book, The Wheat Belly. Uh, that, that may be a factor. Autism, we don't know. It's probably a multifactorial thing, but mercury is certainly a suspicion. So these toxins, now we finally get to the thyroid. We get to the thyroid, and uh, I'm going to introduce a term to all of you called 5 prime diiodinase, which is on the chart here. And uh, we'll get to that. Let me just look, show you what, what your doctor normally sees and thinks about when you go to have your thyroid tested. Because a lot of people who have this syndrome, they're tired. They're wore out. They've got a lot of symptoms of low thyroid. But when they go into the doctor to get tested, he runs a TSH level and comes back normal. So he says, I guess it must not be your thyroid. And so the, th the TSH is really a regulator hormone from your brain to your thyroid gland, which is the factory that makes the thyroid hormone, which is called T4 because there's four iodines. So they call it T4, and this is what Synthroid is. If you're low, he'll give you Synthroid. And that's mostly what doctors think about is what I call the glandular regulation system of the thyroid. But a lot of the patients I see, this is not an unusual patient for me is when I, when I ask them to fill out this form just to check the things that they have going on in their health system. Uh, now, this person checked a lot of them, but I'll, I'll say very typically people will check over half of them. There's about 60 symptoms on this list. These are all the symptoms of low thyroid, very common symptoms. And yet they said, well, I've been to the doctor and I tested okay. Well, there's another part of the thyroid system that the doctor really doesn't think about called the peripheral regulation of the thyroid metabolic system. And this is where the T4 uh, is converted by this 5' prime diiodinase to T3. So this iodine right here is removed by this enzyme, and now you have just three iodines, and they call it T3. T3 is about four times the metabolic power of, uh, of T4. And so when you, when you go to have, uh, just a little side note, if you go in and you're taking something that contains T3, like Armour Thyroid or, or actual T3, there's a very strong feedback loop here that reduces your TSH. And so that, that causes some concern among the medical doctors. But so these, not only, not only is this T3 production reduced, but all the time, your body's also converting the T4 to reverse T3. The RT3 is called reverse T3, and that enzyme is, is 5-diiodinase, and it takes off the other iodine. So you have this iodine missing, and if you look at these two and compare them, the reverse T3 is the reverse of the T3. The big difference is, at the cellular level, this key is a blank key. It'll fit into receptor sites, but it won't really do anything. And so if you have a problem with these two, with the 5-diiodinase being blocked for some reason, your TSH will come back normal. Your free T4 may be kind of high normal. Your free T3 will be low, maybe normal or low. But the reverse T3 will actually be high. And so what we've started doing is measuring the reverse T3 in order to using a lab test to identify this particular problem. If this enzyme is blocked, and that's what I'm going to get to, if something is blocking this enzyme, you'll see this, this, this pattern, and the patient will have all the symptoms of low thyroid, even though their TSH is normal. So this is the explanation for why you went to the doctor and the doctor said your thyroid's okay. But yet, 
what we find is we see a reduction in the T3 metabolism. We see all the signs of low thyroid in patients who have this whole syndrome. So when I put all, these, all this part of this together, if you have low T3 and high reverse T3, you're going to have reverse T3 starting to fill these keyholes on your cells, but they don't do anything. They just block the receptor site, and so you can't get enough T3 in, and so your, your metabolism starts to just slowly go down. It can happen over months and years, and you're wondering, why am I just gradually feeling so tired? It doesn't happen all at once. It happens very slowly. The theory is, is that when, when our ancestors were hunter-gatherers, when we were hunter-gatherers, if we had a bad hunting day or a bad hunting week or two weeks and there wasn't enough food around, this system of the reverse T3 uh, slowing down the metabolism actually saved our lives. It, it reduced our consumption of calories and we could survive a, 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 a bad famine, so to, speak, so to speak. And that's why fasting is one of the things that will block this enzyme. Stress will block this enzyme. Infection will block the enzyme, and toxins and inflammation will block the enzyme. What have I just been talking about all through this whole presentation? These are the same things that set people up for the pot belly syndrome. All these things over here are made worse by low T3, which is caused by blocked 5-deiodinase, which is caused by toxins, stress, infection, inflammation, and then um, fasting. And a lot of people who go on diets, that's like a fasting. The body thinks, uh-oh, uh, no food. Uh, we're, we're, we're in a famine. And so it, it invokes this system. It makes the pot belly syndrome worse. Does everyone kind of see how this all kind of, it's, a, it's almost like it's a diabolical scheme to make you fat. <laughs> Stressing you out, right? Okay, so now what we're going to do, now what we're going to do, just so I don't leave you with that, that sense of we're doomed, let's, I've, I put that sheet on your pay, on your, at your place of the, of the major factors that are contributing to this. Let's, as an audience now, let's think together what are the things we could do to have an impact on all these different elements that are part of the, uh, the pot belly syndrome. What can we do with antibiotics? Yeah, yeah, you could read just, you know, uh, what they're really saying in family medicine is don't just rush to the doctor. You know, there's, you know, take more vitamin C, take more vitamin D, stay home and rest, you know, take better care of yourself, zinc, lozenges, things like that can help. Uh, eating, eating your fruits, eating better, getting exercise, people who exercise regularly, getting sunshine. Sunshine is very good for helping your immune system. So you can reduce, reduce antibiotics, you know, just reduce your intake. There, matter of fact, there are some nice little herbal type antibiotics, uh, things like uh, uh, olive leaf extract, echinacea. There's some things you can do that are not prescription antibiotics so that if you're having a viral infection, don't just rush and get an antibiotic. That's not the first thing to do. Now my mom, she just believes that antibiotics are everything and so she, it's hard for her to resist that. Now, and sometimes you do need the antibiotics. I'm not against antibiotics, but I think we need to cut down on And then what about intake? What about getting organic dairy? You know, a lot of people say, well, I, I can't afford organics. And I say, well, if you had to afford one category of organics, I would say buy organic dairy. Get orda organic butter, organic milk, organic uh, cheese if you can, because that's a major source of antibiotics uh, that we, we would be consuming. And if you can find someone who's raising their cattle, a lot of the farmers are raising their cattle now without injections, or they're, they're, they're doing grass-fed, and they're, they're taking better care, better care of the cows, and, and uh, you know, organic-type farmers would be something you could do. So that's, that's an area that you could begin working on right away. And that's going to help you in terms of the germs. You're, gonna, you're gonna, at least not going to be creating more resistance in your germs. But how could you help improve your body's handling of germs? What about? Just wash with soap. Yep, you could, you could still use good hygiene, good, good, you know, hygiene. Good hygiene. And then I was thinking of what about probiotics? You know, do you, have, have, you, have you all heard that, you know, you can use either eating more yogurt or t uh, drinking kefir 
or taking probiotic capsules is a way to kind of make your gut flora have less of these, these uh, more toxic germs in them. And then these two things together should cut down on your rate of infection. Uh, you know, vitamin D, I'm finding out, is fantastic. You know, if you look at the pattern, people get sick during the winter months. That's when the sun's down lower and their vitamin D levels are lower. So for sure, during the winter months, you should maybe bump up your D a little bit. If you're not sure how much to take, you know, you can get it measured. And, and uh, vitamin A can work very nicely with vitamin D, and of course we're a big vitamin C proponents here, so vitamin C, A, and D would be three very good nutrients to, to use in this case. So what about inflammation? What are some of the things that we could do to, to manage inflammation? Yeah, well, yeah, that's now it's getting into the stress, and see, there is a link between stress and inflammation, so anything you can do to reduce your stress, your life is going to be less inflamed. I always say when people are stressed, their lives are inflamed. So you can, you, can do, you can do things to take better care of yourself just in terms of stress. Getting adequate amounts of sleep can make a big difference. People who sleep better tend to have less inflammation. Eating whole foods uh, rather than sugary foods or non-whole foods, that reduces your inflammation. Turmeric, turmeric, turmeric you can get various anti-inflammatory herbs like turmeric. Yeah? What? Omega-3 is big. That's one of the big benefits of omega-3. I, I wrote a little book on inflammation, arthritis, and aging, and I, one of my conclusions was, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with inflammation, in, uh, our ancestors ate a diet that naturally had more omega in it. And so here in the Midwest, we have to work a little harder because we don't eat as much fish out here, but fish is a good source of omega, or you can e easily take some good omega capsules. So that'll reduce your inflammation. Vitamin D is another inflammation regulator. And, and we're now finding out that vitamin K, K2, can be a really good uh, inflammation regulator. And then subsequently, these then reduce these excessive cytokines. They're, they're really tied together. So if you reduce inflammation, you can reduce your, your cytokines. And, uh, and by cutting down on the number of infections you have and reducing your inflammation, you're gonna reduce your cortisol. And if you do uh, better stress management techniques, uh, you can reduce cortisol. And we're finding out there's a number of herbs. Uh, we, we very typically are finding our patients, they've had high cortisol for so long that their adrenal glands are just exhausted. And uh, we, we do an ASI test where we can measure their cortisol levels. And when they're low, we can use things like ginseng, and rhodiola and ashwagandha, different uh, herbs that are very effective at kind of supporting the adrenal glands. With do saliva we do saliva testing, yeah. And then the uh, uh, what I found works very well for the adrenal glands is vitamin C. We we find that vitamin C can be very effective. By the way, we do have a really good new treatment here for infection called UBI, the ultraviolet blood irradiation, where we take a little bit of a person's blood run it through a ultraviolet light, which kills the germs that are in the blood, and then that's reinfused back into the body. The inactivated germs act as a kind of vaccine that, to augment their, their own immune response against whatever infections they're carrying. Uh, see, cortisol, oh, ec you know, exercise. Uh, and you have to be a little bit careful. Some people exercise so hard in an effort to lose weight that they actually increase their cortisol and the net result is they, they can't seem to lose the weight, or they'll lose the weight, but then they, they, they're, they're so hungry after they're exercising that they go and gain it right back after exercising. The insulin resistance, uh, again, that, these, all kind of, these are all trickle-down things. If you take care of all these things up here, your insulin resistance is going to start to go away. Um, I was, I was going to say one other thing about exercise. There's a new form of exercise. It's not new, but it's called peak eight, where you do 30, 30 seconds of intense exercise followed by 90 seconds of real slow exercise and do that in rounds. And what they found there is that it increases the number of mitochondria in your muscle cells. And so you'll burn calories better without necessarily stressing your, yourself out more. And so, uh, so peak eight is a very good form, and that, that actually would help you reduce your insulin resistance. Did you say peak eight? Peak, like 
Yes, you can go online and type in the words in Google peak eight and, it, and it's, there's a lot of new research that it helps balance hormones. It can help you lose weight a little faster than the regular types of exercise. It increases mitochondria in your muscle cells. In the muscle cells. Yeah, because that's what happens to a lot of people. They go on a diet because they really don't like the pot belly syndrome. They have a hard time losing the weight, but what they're actually doing is losing a lot of their muscle mass. And muscle is what burns calories. So even though you've lost weight, it's going to tend to come back unless, you're, unless you just really keep starving yourself, which if you starve yourself, that blocks this 5-diiodinase. And so then your T3 production goes down. And so then you start to feel lethargic and tired. And, and so it's, it's, do you see how the whole concept of causal loops is really the key concept here, that if you can identify something that you're doing that's keeping you trapped in a loop, you need to help yourself get out of it. Uh, I was going to tell you, we, we use iodine here uh, in very careful dosages, which is a way of detoxifying the system, and that reduces some of the toxins. We do chelation here. We help uh, people develop strategies like saunas that can help you to detoxify. Using more organic foods can make a big difference. Uh, in general, just taking charge of your life is a way of reducing stress. Just the, the whole notion that, hey, I've got to kind of do this a little bit at a time. Like, I'm not going to be able to implement all these things at once. But I think what you have to see is that this is a complex situation. And this is why no one has invented a pill yet. I know the drug companies are furiously looking for the, the pill that will get you to lose weight without totally wrecking yourself. Because most of the weight loss pills have not been shown to be very healthy and probably are not a good idea. So, uh, and most of the things that when you feel bad because of all this, the antidepressants and some of the medicines that are used to control emotions, they actually make insulin resistance worse. So be very careful about which medicines you're choosing uh, in terms of how you're managing the consequences of this, this particular syndrome. So I've hit you with a lot of information, but I tried to give it to you in a way that you could kind of see how this all fits together. And, and, uh, and that you can start to work on different elements of this and put together a game plan for yourself that will help you eventually to get the, to get the, uh, the gut to go away. <laughs> but a lot of people say, doctor, what can I do to get, my, get rid of my belly fat? I say, have you got an hour? You know, we can, we can go through this. But I'm glad you came today because this does kind of paint the picture of what's really happening to people in our world. And this is why I believe that the, you know, everyone asks me, well, are, are you for healthcare reform? Are you against health? Or where do you stand? Do you think it's gonna work? And my concern is, is that just changing the insurance system itself is not going to deal with all these factors that everyone in the world almost now is being exposed to. I think we have to get a deeper level of understanding about what constitutes health in our time and what it'll take to restore health in our time. And it's not a simple proposition, but yet it's doable because every day I have patients that are working on this because this now gives you a roadmap, even though it's a complicated roadmap, it does give you a map that you can start to follow to help you uh, make some uh, advances in uh, controlling some of these different elements in your own causal loops. So any questions? Um, for people of more or less average size, what do you think is about the right vitamin D total dose per day? 4,000. That's what I think. But I, again, you know, what we found is that it, there's quite a bit of variation depending upon uh, how sick they are, mm -hmm. their level of toxicity. Um, so some people do need more than that. Some people can get by on less than that. How much did you say? 4,000 units of vitamin D, of D3. D3. Mm -hmm. four That's thousand, why I'm. 4,000 a day? Yeah, average. Okay. That's what I'm finding. Uh, and that's going to give you. Is that milligrams or international units or it's, what? It's uh, 4,000 international units. I take 5,000 a day. My thyroid is really fine. I'm on a higher dose. My vitamin D levels did between 16 and 17. Yeah, and say so that what this. 
this lady is saying is that, you know, she takes 5,000 units a day, but her blood level stays between 60 and 70, and that's what I like. The normal range for most labs is 32 to 100. Our lab is 40 to 80. So 60 is a nice number to shoot for because that's kind of in the middle. And so you should, you should be safe with that. That's the blood level of vitamin that's D. That's the blood level of vitamin D. And so you're, you're actually using what your body, you're, you're using a reference point for where your body is instead of just how much should I take? Well, how much do you need? It depends on what you need to get your blood level to about that 60 point. Where do we find more information about PIT, PIT A? Mercola.com, M-E-R-C-O-L-A.com. If you type in his search box, uh, PIT 8, he has some very nice videos where he has some, some of the experts who did the research on PIT 8 go through uh, all the benefits, like it, it enhances your growth hormone output, which can help you sleep better. It uh, increases the number of mitochondria, like I was talking about. The thing I like about it is it's, it basically is 16 to 20 minutes three times a week. So you can compress your exercise uh, and still get more benefits. Spell his name again. M-E-R-C-O-L-A, Mercola.com. Yes, Thank just a second. Um, I do have a Hashimoto thyroid. Mm -hmm. Would you suggest anything else that I'm taking here in the vitamins? Because I take Centroid, but Centroid is not enough. No. The, yeah. the theory, one of the theories of Hashimoto's thyroid diet is, remember I showed the slide on endocrine disruptors. All of your endocrine system seems to be very vulnerable to toxins, uh, the various ones that I showed. But it's of all the endocrine glands, the thyroid seems to be the most vulnerable. That's why people have so many problems with their thyroid. But iodine, it's been found, if you use it in small doses to start with and kind of build it up gradually, the thyroid likes the iodine. It'll take it up and it'll push out a lot of those toxins. So it's a way of detoxifying the thyroid gland. And that, the theory is, is that some of Hashimoto's is caused by uh, toxins in the gland. But you have to be careful and not move up too fast. I'd recommend doing it with a doctor. Yes, ma'am. So if you, if, you, if you have these symptoms and you uh, uh, go into the doctor, very often he'll, he'll assume you're depressed because you have multiple symptoms and you're tired and you know, nothing is really standing out as a cause. So he'll say, well, you must be depressed. And, so, and you know, oftentimes you are because you feel so bad. <laughs> but it's not the depression causing the symptoms. The symptoms, in a sense, are causing the depression. Not always. Uh, Broda Barnes uh, and Dennis Wilson, Dr. Dennis Wilson, have both worked with the temperature as a diagnostic thing. If, you want to, if, you want, if you've got a lot of these symptoms and your body temperature is low, that's a pretty good sign that your meta metabolism is, is down. Uh, what I've found in working with thyroid is I can get people feeling better, but I don't always get their temperature to come up right away. And, I, and it may be that I'm not dealing with enough of these components. Some people, they do normalize their temperature, but not always. You can feel better without normalizing your temperature. When, when are the, the RT3 test and the thyroid antibody tests called for? If you've got a complex illness and you're, you're doing uh, many different interventions that are not working, I would include it in a, in a workup. I would, I would do the thyroid antibodies and the reverse T3. We've recently added, we have a thyroid panel now that includes reverse T3, and then we t oftentimes do the um, Hashimoto's antibodies as well. Yes? What about long standing goiter? I've just had one for years. Well, goiter typically means that you've been iodine deficient for a long time, and very few doctors measure iodine level because they assume if you're just eating salt, you're getting enough iodine from the iodized salt, which that iodine is not absorbed very well, uh, and it may be, you know, everyone has a different need level of, for, for different nutrients. Uh, and plus, a lot of the uh, commercial food has salt in it, but not iodized salt. And so it's, you can still develop an iodine deficiency, in, in, and, and a lot of people have cut back on their salt for other reasons. And so 
There's, there are ways that you could develop an iodine deficiency and that could cause a goiter. You can also get a toxic nodular goiter, which is a, another problem, uh, but sometimes it's related, it can be related to toxic factors or to iodine deficiency. Yeah, and see, the problem is uh, you, the reverse T3 test would be a good one to do, but I was, I've been trying to do it more, and I've, and I've had some patients come back and say, our labs don't do that anymore. Uh, you know, unless the doctor knows about reverse T3 and what it means, he won't order the test. Uh, so it's, it, yeah, we do them here, yeah. So, uh, so reverse T3, it, it can be helpful. Now, the other thing to me is that if, if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and <laughs> quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And so I'll very often give people a clinical trial of low thyroid or of thyroid medicine to see how they do. And, and, and but not just that. That, that's the, that, that is the, that's what I'm trying to get across here is that just by treating the thyroid alone, you haven't addressed all the components, all the elements of the loops. You have to think about where else might I be being tripped up and start to work on those things as well. But, but, but if you don't have the thyroid, then that's a major factor that can keep you locked into the loop. And it's a, it can be a genetic thing. Oh yeah, I meant to comment on that. Uh, very often the thyroid issue is passed down the mother's side. Uh, uh, part of that's because the mitochondria that you have, the, the uh, genes of the mitochondria only come from the mother. So, uh, so very often you'll see this coming down the mother's side. Well, do they still call this area something like thyroid alley? Goiter, goiter, goiter alley. alley. Yeah, yeah uh, they don't call it that because goiters have been largely eliminated by iodized salt. But I think, I think you could call it thyroid alley, you know, because we, I see so many people that have some, some degree of thyroid issue. Yeah. Meditation would be an excellent choice. Uh, I mean, if you can reduce your stress, the reason that's so important is because the body does want to heal. You know, when you see a, when you see a presentation like this, you think, oh my gosh, our bodies don't know anything. They, they're really very wise, but we have to take care of them and we have to provide the environment. And with meditation, you have to take the time to stop and, and do meditation, but it's very, very worthwhile as a self-regulatory technique, and so I strongly do advise it, used to teach it. You made some statement early in your lecture, and I don't remember what you tied it to, about armothyroid and some concern. Um, yeah, the thing I was talking about is, and I'll go back to that real quick, it is very often people will, oh here, let's do it right here, people will will start on armor thyroid, and armor thyroid is a blend of T4 and T3. And the T3 in armor thyroid is, is uh, four times as potent as the T4. That's, this is one-fourth the potency of this. This is so potent that the feedback loop to the TSH is very strong. And so you'll tend to see the TSH go down quite a bit when people are put on armor thyroid. And the doctor who's used to prescribing only Synthroid, he's only dealing with this loop right here, he's not aware that armor thyroid has T3 in it. The T3, T3 thing may not mean anything to him. And so he's just thinking, you're on too much armor thyroid. Uh, he, and so he'll want, want you to either switch back to Synthroid or to lower your dose. And that, so what I recommend is instead of doing TSH levels if you're on armor thyroid, do fasting T3s and maybe a reverse T3 now and then to see where that's at. Here at our clinic, we have, the, we have the protocol that I want people to not take their thyroid that morning because, normally you take thyroid in the morning, because that gives you what's, there's, you, if you take it right after you've taken your thyroid, you're going to get a peak level 
and it'll make it look like it's too high. So I do what's called a trough level, which is right before the next dose, which would be that morning. Is. Uh, some people do take their thyroid twice a day. Most people can get by with once a day, but I do have patients that need it twice a day. I wouldn't do it that way. I mean, you're still gonna you're still gonna get a peak, enough of a peak that it's gonna be confusing to interpret it. Okay, I think probably we ought to stop, and I'll I'll hang around if you have specific questions. Thank you for being good students. Mm -hmm.